Um, so thank you to the Folks Foundation and to the Academy of Medical Sciences for this immense privilege and honor. I'm very grateful to be able to share some of the insights that my team and I have gained in the area of whole genome sequencing today. So this audience will no doubt be extremely knowledgeable regarding how the speed and scale of DNA sequencing has increased by orders of magnitude in the last few decades. The benefits shown by whole genome sequencing has been clear in the recent pandemic, and similarly in the field of cancer, because the cancer genome evolves, is marked by and to some extent driven by mutations, sequencing cancer genomes is of particular value in cancer biology. In terms of sequencing strategies, one could perform a limited amount of sequencing, several hundred genes in a targeted panel assay, or sequence the protein coding regions in a whole exome sequencing experiment, or today one could sequence the entire 3,000 million base pairs of the human genome in a single sitting and obtain all the mutational insights there are to offer. The returns from these sequencing experiments are quite markedly different. And here are the results from the same tumor sequenced in the three different ways. We get one mutation by targeted sequencing, 43 by exome sequencing, and four and a half thousand if we did a whole genome. The power test to see biological information is hundreds to thousands of fold higher when we do a whole genome compared to the other two sequencing strategies. So let's walk through the cancer whole genome data from a real patient. So she's de-identified, de her name is PD6413A. We have her chromosomal ideogram on the outside, chromosomes one, two, three, four, five, all the way around to X and Y going clockwise. Going inwards, we have her substitutions. These are single base changes that we can also present in this way. You saw this, this pattern presented earlier. Note that she has a typical TP53 mutation that would be considered a cancer-inducing driver mutation. Going inwards again, we have small insertions and small deletions, which we can present in this way to show that she has an excess of a particular kind of deletion that is classically associated with deficiency of a DNA repair pathway called homologous recombination or HR. Now this is underscored by the fact that the patient has inherited a BRCA1 germline frame shift indel mutation. This is something she's inherited from one of her parents. And BRCA1 is a critical gene involved in HR, which may explain this indel pattern. Um, next, we have copy number information. So note how human cancers often display chromosomal copy number abnormalities. Green is for gains, and our patient has chromosomal gains on chromosome one and chromosome eight. And pink indicates losses. And as you can see, she has a lot of copy number losses throughout the genome, another pattern. We see other cancer-causing copy number abnormalities, including an amplification of MYC and a complex transection of P10. And last but not least, she has structural variation or rearrangements, and these involve breaks of the sugar phosphate backbone of DNA that then relocates and forms a connection elsewhere in the genome. This patient has over 300 rearrangements. They're all green tandem duplications, a very particular class of rearrangements. They're all less than 10 KB in length and they are beautifully distributed throughout the genome. These patterns that I've just described to you are classical mutation patterns of BRCA1 deficiency and sometimes referred to as brca by the community. Incidentally, our patient also has a sizable amount of mutagenesis due to a family of enzymes called Apovex which may be an indicator of dysregulation of the cell cycle, another common abnormality in cancers. And this reminds us that when you do a whole genome, you obtain a comprehensive picture of the total genomic state. By contrast, when we look at many genomic clinical trials today, we tend to use genomic information as single data points, a single PIK3CA mutation, a single EGFR mutation, to stratify patients into clinical trials. And in so doing, we ignore the rest of the tumor context, which could be clinically relevant. So here's our patient PD6413A again with her inherited BRCA1 mutation. And here are the cancer genomes of two other women. Neither of them have inherited BRCA1 mutations, but to look at these three cancer genomes together, they look nearly identical. The middle one has an acquired or somatic mutation in BRCA1. And the one on the right does not have any genetic defects of BRCA1. She has an epigenetic promoter hypermethylation of BRCA1 instead. So each of these patients has individually thousands of mutations, not a single one shared in common between them. 
Yet by taking this holistic cancer genome profiling approach, you can instantly recognize the biological state of a cancer as being BRCA1 deficient, even if how they have become BRCA deficient is different. And that's because what they share in common are patterns or mutational signatures that are pathognomonic and distinguishing. And it's this pattern recognition um, uh, uh, quality that we use in our machine learning methods, which, were, which I will come to shortly. So the concept of mutational signatures was first described in 2012 when I was a PhD student working alongside Ludmil Alexandrov in the laboratory of Mike Stratton at the Wellcome Sanger Institute. The cancer genome serves as an archaeological record of mutagenic processes that have occurred through tumor development, all endogenous and environmental processes that have contributed to that cancer are etched into its genome. And over the years, we've learned about the etiologies of some mutational signatures, but certainly not all of them. And when we sequence a cancer genome, what you see is that final portrait, a composite of all the signatures added together. And in the case of our patient, she had two of these in her genome, the signatures of HR deficiency or BRCA deficiency and that epobec related mutagenesis. So the subject of mutational signatures has grown substantially from its first description in 2012 and landmark paper in 2013 to the enormous field that it is today. It's got thousands and thousands of PubMed hits. There are also experimental efforts to obtain the ground truths of mutational signatures performed in my lab and that of many others across the world. We do need to validate what are otherwise purely computational or analytical efforts. In the interest of time, I'd like to highlight just two things one at either end of this, um, this timeline. So at one end, I will show an example of the value of being given the freedom to explore as a student. And at the other end, how we have tried to derive clinical utility from mutational signatures, developing machine learning algorithms, taking them through clinical validation and implementation through the national genomics endeavor. So onto my first vignette. Uh, and this is about how the freedom to explore led to deriving mechanistic insights into mutational patterns. So in this patient's breast cancer genome, this is another patient altogether, we noted that the patient had an area of unusually dense mutagenesis on chromosome six. So let's zoom into chromosome six and I'll orientate you. The horizontal axis reports the chromosome six coordinates. So the P arms on the left and the Q arms on the right. The Y axis reports the intermutation distance. And that is the distance from one mutation to the one immediately preceding it in the reference genome. So most mutations, these dots here, most mutations are somewhere between 100,000 to a million bases away from each other, except in this region where all the mutations are very close to one another, tens to hundreds of base pairs away only. But also they're all of the same class. They're all red, they're all C to T mutations. When we layered on other classes of mutation, and here the orange triangles are structural variation or rearrangements, to our surprise, we found this marked co-localization between two very different classes of mutation. And it's as if some catastrophic mutational storm had happened in this region, and we called this phenomenon cataegis. So let's look at this site at, at, at even higher resolution, something that is possible because of modern sequencing data. So we can zoom to this 100 megabase window, zoom down 100 fold to 1 megabase window, zoom 100 fold again to 10 KB windows. We can see these micro clusters of C to T mutations. And now we've zoomed down to single nucleotide resolution, and you are looking at the sequencing reads directly to reveal that the red C to T mutations are all happening in cis on the same DNA molecule. In fact, the C to T mutations are almost always preceded by a T-thymine, and they occur on the same strand in this manner that's called process processive or processivity. So altogether, these characteristics are indicative of the activity of a family of enzymes called apobex. It's a rather interesting family of cytidine deaminases that actually evolved to restrict single-stranded viruses like COVID. And it is believed that as cancer cells evolve, they lose control of the cell cycle, and there are these moments of transient single-strandedness, which is the substrate of apobec, resulting in these florid signatures of apobec mutagenesis in human cancers. So while whole genome sequencing can give you big data, aggregated insights, deep dive, detailed analysis can give you mechanistic clues into the causes of mutagenic processes in cancer. 
So our observations led to being featured on the cover of Cell, which was a highlight of my career, until my mother pointed out that not only had I delayed becoming an NHS consultant, which for many Asian moms is a social milestone, I now had a PhD in pretty patterns. And how did this benefit mankind in any way at all? So that brings me to my second story, where my team and I set out to develop clinical applications for mutational signatures. As I mentioned earlier, we can apply machine learning methods to whole genome sequencing data to distinguish biological states that may be therapeutically targetable. Our aim is to, do, to develop algorithms that can help to classify tumors to facilitate interpretation of cancer genomes. So I'll focus on one of our algorithms called HR Detect, designed to identify cancers that have this holistic uh, BRCA deficiency phenotype, this bracha that I showed you earlier. Why? Because bracha tumors are reported as being potentially sensitive to targeted treatments such as platinums and PARP inhibitors, initially created to treat women who had inherited BRCA1 and 2 cancers. So machine learning helped us create HR Detect. We then applied HR Detect on an already sequenced cohort of 560 breast cancer genomes. We found a surprisingly greater proportion of breast cancers that had high HR Detect scores in indicative of BRCA than we had expected. BRCA wasn't limited to the 1 or 5% of the cohort, which was the anticipated proportion of people with inherited BRCA defects. Instead, it was present in 22% of the cohort. That's one in every five breast cancers examined. So we took this group of high scoring cases to understand why they had such high scores. And we had recruited knowingly um, 22 women who had germline BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. So these were patients with inherited BRCA deficiency and all of them were correctly detected. So that's good. We uncovered 32 additional families with inherited BRCA1 and BRCA2 defects. These are the ones shown in blue that were not previously known to have these mutations. So this has implications, of course, for familial genetic counseling. 22 cases in orange had acquired BRCA1 or 2 defects through genetic and epigenetic me mechanisms. And in a third of the cases in gray, we could not find a genetic or epigenetic cause to explain the mutational signatures and the high scores. This was, however, an important message that there could be a greater proportion of cases that have high HR detect scores and brackiness and potential sensitivity to targeted therapeutics than we are currently detecting if we did not take the whole genome sequencing and signature strategy in profiling cancers. In other words, if we only sequence BRCA1-2 genes, in the targeted sequencing approaches that are more commonly used today, we might detect the blue and purple categories, about half the orange category, and we wouldn't detect any of the ones in gray. So at this point, we have an algorithm. It predicts biology. It does not actively demonstrate clinical value. To do that, we had to apply HR Detect into a prospective population study. So this was a new independent cohort of triple negative breast cancers. It's a particular kind of breast cancer with, of unmet need. And this was in the Scan B Swedish project, where critically, they had complete clinical information, that is treatment and outcome data over many years. And having that clinical data is absolutely critical for demonstrating clinical utility. And we found HR Detect was able to prognosticate. High HR Detect scoring cases had better outcomes on standard of care therapy for triple negative breast cancer. And this was irrespective of whether we could find the genetic or epigenetic cause for the signatures. So when we took this group highlighted by the green arrow and we split them into two groups shown in this lower kaplan Maya plot, those cases where we could find a genetic or epigenetic driver were shown in black, uh, while those that we could not are shown in gray. And as you can see, there's no difference in outcome between these two groups of patients, indicating that the mutational signatures and HR detect algorithm could prognosticate even when a causative driver mutation couldn't be identified. So important to note again that limited targeted sequencing approaches, just sequencing BRCA1 and 2 would miss the gray cohort altogether and would miss half the black cohort as well because half of that was um, due to epigenetic mechanisms. So we've got prognostic capabilities, has it got predictive capabilities? So we collaborated with colleagues in London, Nick Turner at the ICR and um, Clovis, and this was um, a small proof of principle phase two clinical trial called RIO. We applied HR detect in patients with newly diagnosed triple negative breast cancer that had a treatment window of two weeks of a PARP inhibitor. 
we showed that cancers with HR detect high scores had functional deficits in HR through molecular biological techniques, specifically impaired red 51 foci formation. And critically, we found that HR detect high scoring cases were associated with evidence of response to PARP inhibition. And this has been demonstrated by a reduction in the amount of circulating tumor levels in the blood. So a CDR15 ratio is the number of tumor copies in blood found at the end of treatment on day 15 compared to at the start of treatment. So a low level is indicative of therapeutic response. So here we have shown early predictive capabilities of our algorithm as well. So I've used an example of how we've taken one clinical algorithm from data science through to clinical validation, uh, demonstrating prognostic and predictive value in our effort to improve interpretation of whole cancer genomes. Our next steps include implementation into the national genomic strategy to enable equitability of access to these tools and to enable phase three clinical studies nationally. An important point to be aware of is that all our algorithmic developments are created on aggregated de-identified data. It is of incredible value to have access to anonymized genomic and clinical data to perform these integrative analyses and to gain population level insights and create the algorithms. Yet once implemented, these algorithms can bring benefits at an individual level for our patients. So let's walk through some of those real individual examples where holistic whole cancer genome profiling could be informative. Here is a uterine cancer from an NHS patient. Whole genome and signature analysis reveals imprints of brackenness noted by the yellow arrows and a high HR detect score. What treatments could she get? PARP inhibitors and platinum are not necessarily available to such patients. So what trials could she go into instead? What would her treatment options be if all we were guided by was that TP53 mutation from a typical targeted sequencing assay instead? What knowledge have we lost? Here is a patient's pancreatic cancer with a typical KRAS driver mutation. This patient has signatures of another DNA repair disorder order, mismatch repair deficiency, and an MMR detect score of one. I didn't describe this today, but this is another one of our algorithms that we have done in partnership with Genomics England. And this patient could potentially be eligible for immunotherapy. Here is a patient with an aggressive metastatic angiosarcoma with drivers of P53 and CDKN2A in his tumor. And he also has inherited mutations in XPC, a gene involved in the nucleotide excision repair pathway and critical to sanitizing the genome from UV damage. Patients with XPC mutations suffer from photosensitivity and often develop cutaneous malignancies in early life. This case demonstrates the importance of interpreting all the data together. So we see an enormous amount of UV-related mutagenesis, but as a person with dysfunctional XPC, he is unable to fix UV damage. So this level of UV mutagenesis is normal for him. It's what all his normal skin cells would look like. What was driving his metastatic disease was this in signature instead, which may look modest and unimportant, but is associated with proofreading mutations in polymerase epsilon, so post-replicative repair, or POL-E. POL-E tumors are important to identify because POL-E defective tumors are reported to be sensitive to immunotherapies. And indeed, here are the patient's scans pre-treatment with extensive disseminated metastatic disease. He eventually went on to pembrolizumab, and after three cycles of pembrolizumab, you can see a significant reduction in the volume of disease. And by seven cycles, everything had melted away. And in our PPIE interactions with this patient, this young man, in his words, he describes being treated as an individual with cancer as opposed to another angiosarcoma. So I hope that I've taken you today through um, uh, demonstrating sort of how the increasing power afforded by whole genome sequencing permits insights into mutational signatures, and then how detailed analysis can give us mechanistic clues. Aggregated analysis for many de-identified cancers can help us create classification algorithms, but once clinically valid validated and implemented for clinical use, the benefits can be reaped at the individual level for our patients. With that, I would like to conclude by first acknowledging the giants of DNA biology and chemistry, the completion of the Human G Genome Project, the ambitious international sequencing endeavors, the visionary leaders, all of whom had created the paths to enable people like me to explore in data science. 
we cannot derive insights and harness the power of sequencing for clinical purposes without that prior context. Our work as a scientific team will not be possible without the charitable support from all our funders and without the generous patients, families, and clinicians that have contributed samples. I'd like to thank an extensive list of consortial collaborators. All our work is collaborative and more specific ones for the work highlighted today, mentors and sponsors. Finally, it's been my great pleasure and privilege to have met and worked with this remarkable group of people that is my team. The passion and energy of this diverse and international group, um, they, they make the goals achievable, but mostly they make the journey the best part of the scientific process. Thank you once again to the Folks Foundation and Academy of Medical Science for this immense honor. Thank you.